Hello everyone, my name is Alexis Oliveros. I'm an anthropology undergraduate at UCLA. And today I'm going to be presenting Care and Education in Thai Refugee Camps. There are nine camps on the Thai Burma border, and here's the list of their names. While two of these camps are located between the Kareni State and Thailand, the other seven refugee camps are located between the Karen State and Thailand. In the picture is the Myra Lang Refugee Camp. Across all nine camps, it was approximated that there are 136,400 refugees, according to the 2014 Thailand report by the UNHCR. However, the accuracy is debated due to many refugees being unregistered and a lack of proper data filing and management. As I mentioned before, seven of the refugee camps are located between the Karen State and Thailand. Because of their location, when looking at the dominant ethnic groups within those seven camps, approximately 61% of them are Karen, with the second largest group being Kareni, which make up 17%. The female to male ratio is about 49 to 51, which is about even. 45% of refugees are under 18 years old, and 35% are aged 5 to 18, which are considered primary and secondary school age. In 1984, when the Thai government realized that Karen refugees would be unable to return home, they allowed them to set up temporary camps with the understanding they would return home as soon as possible. They have maintained the perspective and policy that humanitarian commitment for refugees is only temporary. Being a refugee or displaced person, as the Thai government calls it under their migration laws, you have a certain administrative status that will only apply to you so long as you stay in the camps. However, if you leave the camps, you are considered an illegal migrant, meaning you are not permitted to enroll in Thai public schools. Because refugees were unable to attend public Thai education, they were allowed to create their own schools. With permission from the Royal Thai government, NGOs were only allowed to provide minimal help for this. However, it wasn't until 1996 that the official mandate was created for NGOs to provide support for education. While NGOs have proven helpful, they unfortunately diminished the community's agency to fully create their own education services and control the development of their own society. In the camps, there is a strong sense of community ownership regarding the education system, and education is highly valued. The school committee, which is made up of community members, determines the school policy, which is meant to be closely related to the KRCEE policy. The KRCEE, or the Karen Refugee Committee Education Entity, replaced the Karen Education Department, or KED, in 2009. The KRCEE still has to follow policies set by the Thai government. However, they do have overall jurisdiction over the education in all seven Karen camps. Primary and secondary schools are largely funded by international NGOs, and the remainder of funding is provided by charity organizations, community-based organizations, and contributions from parents and community members themselves. However, recently, one of the largest funding NGOs for education, the ZOA, has been phasing out its operations within the camps. So what types of schools are found within the Karen refugee camps? There's nursery, primary, secondary, post-secondary, vocational, and adult. In the 2011 Education for All Global Monitoring Report, it is reported that there are a total of 70 schools with about 80 head teachers and 1,600 teachers all supporting the education of more than 34,000 students in the seven predominantly Karen camps. However, post-secondary, vocational, and adult are not offered regularly, and the classes outside of normal school hours and adult classes are often filled by kids who come late in the year and are looking to catch up. This is very different compared to the readings we had on Nashira and Sarau. As we read, Nashira only had access to a primary school where Saul Ralph went to a boarding school, and the sisters were able to finish secondary and even continue to college. Because of Thailand's perspective of the camps being temporary, refugees are not allowed to build permanent structures, meaning the schools, classrooms, many class tables, and benches are made from bamboo. Bamboo is not a good sound insulator or a heat regulator, making classrooms often hot and noisy from other classrooms. The semi-permanent bamboo structures are not allowed to be expanded. 
The Thai government also has a policy that all book contents cannot have political thoughts, feelings, or values. There is also no electricity at the schools, which has recently been a large point of conversation due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the necessity for online learning. It also restricts the ability for refugees to access learning resources. The schools are also not fully equipped to accommodate learning and physical disabilities. The entire staff is made up of refugees residing in the camp with help from outside organizations. With regards to NGOs, they are only allowed to advise the teachers, but not allowed to teach themselves. In these schools, there is a very high teacher turnover rate. In 2010, 35 teachers out of 173 resettled. Because of constant resettlement, the training period for teachers was reduced to only two weeks. This leaves most teachers inexperienced and undertrained. Additionally, teachers sometimes arrive in the middle of the year unsure of what was being taught by the teacher before them, causing a gap in confusion in children's education. This also makes it difficult for teachers to build relationships with their students, which in turn makes it difficult to offer help to the students that need it. Many teachers are also just out of secondary school and often end up teaching childhood friends. This makes it difficult for students to listen and respect their teachers, especially in a class of about 60 students in a small classroom. Regarding school costs, primary is usually between $1.20 to $3, and for secondary, $2.15 to $3.70. These are US dollar approximations. Despite low incomes, most parents have reported being able to pay these costs. Despite these recordings by parents, in a study by Suano, 13.8% of primary students and 15.6% of secondary students reported that they had siblings not going to school due to school fees. In that same study, out of 2,130 parents, 27.4% of them said their child dropped out of school with reasons being marriage, costs, family issues, the child decided to not continue, or the child had to help their family by working. Boys were also found to be more likely to drop out at the end of primary school due to family finances, and girls were most likely to drop out of school later during the secondary period due to teenage pregnancy or marriage. Although there is no official policies for girls not being allowed to attend for these reasons, school principals, such as in the Myra Ma Long camp, believe there are. While there are many more complex aspects to delve into regarding care and education in Thai refugee camps, I am only limited to these 10 minutes and would like to end by showing and examining the short video with you of the Mai Potom Primary School in the Mai La Refugee Camp. As you can see in the video, there is a young teacher, most likely who has recently graduated from secondary school, and the classroom is a temporary type structure that the Thai government allows. You can even see in one part in the video that there are other classrooms on the other side of the wall with another teacher. Additionally, there is also no electricity. Thank you everyone for allowing me the time to present this information to you. This is a list of my references, which you can also use to learn more about this subject and read about on your own time. They are very interesting and informative reads. And once again, thank you.